I'm gonna have to get a bit more quiet in the audio. I'll just give people a heads up about it. Maybe it's too hard. Anna? Can you hear it better now? Okay, we're transmitting now. <laughs> so welcome um, to the online discourse program from Radical Sounds Latin America. Um, this is the third edition of, uh, of the Festival Radical Sounds Latin America that is uh, based in uh, here in Berlin. And we began this project, uh, uh, I began this project with my colleague Talia Vega. And uh, since 2020, we also began the project of editing the publication uh, Border Listening, Escucha Liminal, uh, and this is the second volume of uh, this uh, publication that we did within the framework of the, of the festival. So uh, today we are going to listen to three wonderful contributions that are part of three articles of this, uh, of this book. And uh, of course, if you are interested in the book, uh, it can be found uh, in our website, that is radicalsoundslatinamerica.com. Um, yeah, we, we do uh, worldwide shipping and all that. Uh, so uh, today we are going to listen to Beret uh, Engelhardt, uh, Daniela Avellar, and Anna, Anna Ruiz. Uh, so we will begin with uh, Beret, right? And um, uh, the contribution in this book is called uh, Sonic Cartography in the Rimac Watershed on the Contemporaneity of a Pre-Columbian Acoustic Ecology. And by the way, if you have questions you can put them like e in the chat and we will address the questions after after the lecture there is a a, a small delay between like uh, the transmission the real-time transmission and um, the broadcasting the the streaming I uh, so if you ask a question i will probably um, read it later so Veret Engelhardt is a Peruvian artist and a scholar based in New York. The research centers on acoustic ecologies and pre-Columbian imaginaries, instruments and infrastructures, utilizing a portable instruments like flutes, pututos, shakers, chimes and recordings, and amplifying present elements such as wind, water and stones. Their music is always emergent of the place of its happening. Engelhardt works with the Association de Siembra y Cosecha de Agua, a collective dedicated to research and activism in watersheds 
on the Southern Pacific Coast and is a member of Opera Ensemble, a group of composers and performers working in the intersections of music, environmentalism. Engelhardt is also a PhD candidate in Latin American Cultural Studies in Columbia University. So now, now I'm going to uh, give, uh, give the floor to Beret and I hope you enjoy the lecture. Uh, n now we are going to begin, uh, I was talking, uh, I think I was talking without uh, audio. Did, did, did but we listen to you on, on YouTube. Huh? <laughs> on YouTube, yeah. But did, did I have audio on YouTube? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 oh my God. Okay. <laughs> so we begin with the first uh, lecture. Uh, but it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Alessandra, for putting this all together um, and Radical Sounds Latin America, uh, the team. Um, and yeah, and my fellow contributors here too, Ana and Daniela, and everyone that's tuning in. Um, thank you so much. And I'm going to share screen here. Um, I, I, I listen to your volume a little bit low. I don't know if it's... it's uh... Listen to my presentation. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, here it is. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, today I'll be presenting um, paper on sonic cartography in the Rima's watershed um, on the contemporary University of Colombian acoustic ecology. Um, starting off with Rimac is a river. Um, it's uh, the Sticky River or the Rio Lago. Um, and first I want to do a sort of, uh, yeah, overview that is an underhearing um, to say how this article that I wrote for border listening and considers uh, intersections between sonic cartography, environmental activism, and uh, academic research. And the paper functions as the baseline of sonic maps that are yet to be made, um, articulating their historical and practical grounds and methodological concerns, material limitations, and ethical commitments involving cartographic practice. So they're in the process of being made and organized, but it's a long process as you will see. Uh, uh, but, so but I'm going to start off with my main questions, and then the place where this question comes. But it, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you, your audio is really like uh, broken. Oh, it, really? Yeah, yeah. No. It was really, uh, it was t totally okay in the sound check, but now it's, it's a bit broken. Interesting. Um, Did you make any change? Maybe the audio input is wrong? Oh, maybe in my sharing of the screen, perhaps? Yeah, um, maybe you're sharing. I'm going to start again. I'm going to try to share the screen again. No, no, but it, it was broken. N now it's still broken. Uh, maybe you can. Still broken now? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, should I come out and come back in? Because I'm not really sure why. Is, is maybe you should stop sharing the audio? The microphone is. Yeah, the screen is not totally visible. Wow. Something uh, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna talk back in. Yeah, is that yeah? Is that because I I don't see how else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now now it's really really good. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, now it's better. Now it's better. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think it was connected in Bluetooth somewhere. I think it was a Bluetooth situation. Okay, okay, so, so sorry guys, we're gonna begin again, okay, from the beginning. We start again? Okay. Si, 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 okay. Si. Oh, I was getting a phone call because someone was like, we can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> sorry, everyone. <laughs> well, I was just thinking, um, thank you, Alejandra, and my contributors, and everyone that's here. I hope you heard that. Um, and I'm gonna start off again. Uh, I apologize. And then. Um, 
Is can we hear me okay now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So yeah, this paper uh, is on sonic cartography in the Rimac watershed um, on a contemporaneity of a pre-Columbian acoustic ecology. Uh, start off by saying that Rimac is a river, um, and it's the speaking river del Rio Hablador. Um, so it already has an important relationship to listening, and. I want to give a sort of like overview that is also an underhearing um, of this paper that um, I wrote for Border Listening. And it's an article that consider considers a series of intersections between sonic cartography, environmentalist activism, and academic research. Um, it functions as the baselines of sonic maps that are yet to be made, uh, that are in the process of being made. And so the paper articulates the historical and practical grounds methodological concerns and material limitations um, and the ethical commitments involved in cartographic practice. So I wanna start with the main questions um, that this paper deals with. And then I'm gonna talk more about the place where these questions come from. Um, so what can the territorial approaches to mapping add to the hegemonic modes of representation and planning? How can putting listening at the center of map making intervene in the colonially inherited vision oriented tradition of cartography? And in what ways can the collective practice of mapping when approached from the standpoint of motion transform our communal relations and senses of place? So speaking of place, giving you a sort of ecosystemic overview of the place, um, he, this is Lima, where I come from, uh, largest city in Peru, where a third of the population lives, um, capital port city. Um, if this were leveled, this map, you would show the Andes going up like this. Uh, these, is, these are the Andes going up uh, around like 5,000 meters above sea level. Uh, this is where all the water first, this is the first contact of the rainwater with the land. Um, so here's where the headwaters, the beginning of um, the watersheds are. Um, most of this, like I think over 95% of the water goes into the Amazon rainforest. Uh, and only a small amount actually arrives to the coast. You can see it's like substantially drier uh, and it's also been desertified. I'm gonna talk about that. Um, and yeah, Lima itself is where the, a, th a third of the population lives, as I said. So hydric stress is very real. Um, and if we consider also that water is energy, um, thinking about hydroelectrics, um, Lima consumes way more um, than it can actually handle. Um, so it's an issue. And I, and I choose to begin the city also as a gesture of positioning um, because it is where I come from. It is where I began to walk and began to listen. Uh, and therefore it's where I can speak from as well. Um, and make the point that the foundation of the port city of Lima uh, with Spanish colonialism marks a tradition of shaping the territory in alienation from the land. Um, and this is a shaping that also encompasses cultural and epistemological um, struggles, yeah, that are tied to this land. And so my questions come from a process uh, of decolonization, uh, understood epistemologically and also politically, uh, and from feminist gestures of positionality. So in alliance with communitar communitarian territorial feminism, feminists, uh, I consider my body as a fundamental territory for decolonial struggle, cuerpo territorio tierra. Uh, and at the same time, the territory that fed me as also a site of many struggles that are beyond me. So the way I move through these questions uh, is in a context of collaboration uh, from my work as part of the Asociación de Siembra y Cosecha de Agua. Um, this is an interdisciplinary group dedicated primarily to the implementation and research of the hydrological system known in the Andes as water sowing and harvesting, Siembra y Cosecha de Agua. Uh, we primarily work in Huarochiri a province that is uh, located up the Andes in the province of Lima on the Rimac River. So it is where Lima's water comes from. Um, and both if it's water sowing and harvesting is both an ancestral technology, but also cosmopolitan. Uh, it's a process that involves capturing, deriving, retaining, and filtering water in the headwaters, as Cabeceras de Cuenca on the mountain peaks on the Punas, 
which is where we the photo is I want to talk about. Uh, and sort of rainwater crowns and then enters the mountain. Uh, and subsoils are nurtured and biodiversity proliferates and is made available year round to be harvested during dry season because here there's two seasons, yeah, rain and dry. So water management is extremely important, especially in the Pacific facing Andes. Um, and water sowing and harvesting the sort of the way we learn it, the way we speak of it, it comes from a tradition of considering water as a living being, as a conscious entity with which we have a filial link. So this is where my approach comes from. Um, this photo is in Markawasi. Uh, it's from a trip we made in April. Um, here are some members of the association. Um, it was a trip to register um, the progress of the hydric infrastructure that was built during the pandemic. Uh, here, Renzo Robles is taking pictures. Some of his pictures are in my presentation. Um, here we have Fabricio Mora holding a GPS, uh, taking the GPS points in order to map this infrastructure, uh, which is very important for generating technical reports to build further infrastructure. Um, and this whole project of infrastructure was directed by Gregorio Rios. Um, he's from San Pedro de Casta in Guarochiri. Um, and he, um, he was the one sort of directing the rehabilitation of these water vessels, vessels that we see here uh, in the absence of tourism during the pandemic. Uh, this was built with faenas comunales, with communal uh, sort of working sessions. So before, just to give you an idea, Huarochidi uh, is a place uh, with a lot of tourism, um, Marcahuasi in particular, sorry, the stone park of Marcahuasi, a uh, big camping spot. Gregorio was able to identify right here a pre-Columbian dam um, that he guided the rehabilitation of during the pandemic in the absence of tourism. Uh, and this is the wonderful thing that was able to happen. Um, so this is the, the kind of um, project that we went to map there. Um, this is uh, one of the maps that is in progress um, by the association, uh, made by the architects in the association. Um, there are several of them in their majority architects. Um, and the idea is to sort of interrogate the process of map making, the, of making these kinds of images with an intervention that focuses on sound. And my collaborators were very excited about the presence of sound. And if they're here, shout out to them um, <laughs> for letting me do this. Um, so this is the kind of contrast. This view is very important and necessary, but what does sound do? What are the relationships that sound can introduce to this? Um, so this is a map of the Rimac River, just to give you a sort of idea from the Ministry of Energy and Mining. Uh, you can see the mines in black and the hydroelectric signal, not sure they're signaled here. Um, but here's where Lima is. This is the Rimac. It comes from two rivers, Santa Eulalia and the Rimac. Uh, and we're working right here uh, with the community of San Pedro de Casta in the Santa Eulalia uh, River. And this is kind of, um, as a city dweller in Lima, there is this contradiction, right? How come people in Huarochiri, our headwater, where the water we use all of our lives comes from, how can they need to bring food from Lima? Yeah. Uh, and so this is just to state food sovereignty is um, a huge part of what water sowing and harvesting is about. Um, it's a fight for territorial autonomy that also brings about cultural and historical empowerment um, and is tied to larger histories of decolonial struggle. So I start uh, the beginning of the colony in the foundation of the city of Lima in the 16th century as the city of kings. As I say, it marks a tradition of shaping the territory and alienation from the land following the intervention of Spanish colonialism. So this map for me, the first map of official map of Lima from the 17th century is a very good example of this. Uh, it's emblematic of the slow violence of the physical and mnemonic obliteration of the existing ecosystem by Spanish colonialism. Uh, it is drawn from the perspective of someone that arrives from the ocean the author is specifically arriving to the port of Callao, which is the large, which was the largest port in the Pacific coast at the time and still the largest in our country today. 
Um, and the land is represented as a void, yeah? Only the, the Rimac River, El Rio Lador, uh, undeniable presence can be seen. The gridded plan of Lima, the time a walled city, and now it has expanded all the way up here. It's like everywhere, urban sprawl. Uh, the mountain behind it that is now part of the city, El Cerro San Cristobal here, um, was crowned with a cross. And this cross is very emblematic because San Cristobal uh, is actually a tiracuna, or what the Peruvian anthropologist Marisol de la Cadena translates as earth being. Um, it is sort of an Andean conception of entities like mountains and underground waters as being. And de la Cadena speaks of how since their being cannot be proven, they're relegated to the realm of the non-existence of the cultural, yeah? Um, and here I quote her, evidence or the reasonable composition of facts as signs of events, she writes, is the central technology of history. So from following this line, the tradition of hegemonic systems of historical recording, like writing in Spanish and mapping, inaugurates the dehistorization and perpetuation of the shaping of the territory in alienation from what's living. So what is living? Um, in this map, um, there's no animals here, which is also telling, but um, research, uh, Peruvian research architect Jose Canciani did a sort of hypothetical reconstruction of a valley in an ecosystem very much like that of Lima. And so here we see decentralized urbanization, we see uh, irrigation systems, uh, puquiales and humedales, which are surfacings of water coming from underground channels that actually come from the punas. So this is the literal sowing of the water. You sow on the top and it starts sort of flourishing in the bottom. Um, it's a big trial and error kind of uh, getting to know the territory process. Um, we see the Capagnan, the Incan road systems, the Lomas, an ecosystem also in danger, formed in the mountains with uh, water from cloud formations. Um, we see all of that. Um, what, what is non-existent here, yeah, um, that the intervention onto here was that um, there is practices such as the importation of cattle that came with Spanish colonialism, the overuse of water from the Rimac required to feed them, the uncontrolled deforestation for building with wood and fabricating vegetable carbon, which was not a practice the locals engaged in. Um, and very, very importantly, the forceful separation of the IU units. So the IU are the larger familiar units existent to this day in the Andes that include sort of animals and earth beings. Their destruction into nuclear families and the establishment of mining for export, which stands to this day as the, one of the main economic activities of Peru. Um, this is what contributed to what Peruvian historian Maria Rostorowski calls ecological rupture that materialized in the overall drying of the soil. And these practices reflect a lack of communication between beings, yeah? A sense of planning that is divorced from a tradition of habitation and constitute precisely what I mean by alienation of the territory from the land. So the Wadi and the Incan empires had their political center in the Andes. Um, and this responded to an understanding of the territory as an interconnected landmass and of the practices of circulation of resources as processes that are integral to the territory's geography. And the port city reflects a totally different set of circulation priorities in which the center of accumulation sits besides the boat that will take the resources to an alien but subordinated land far away. Yeah? This is Spain. Um, this extractivist dynamic uh, continues to this day. So from the standpoint of the ecosystem, the geographic expansion of life at the expense, uh, came at the expense of the many life cycles already in place. And of course, at the expense of lives themselves. And so from an ecological standpoint, the so-called conquest can be understood as an expansion of the existing ecology that necessarily brought with it the introduction of new cycles that sustained by the brutal eradication of others. So what do we propose instead is this, a territorial standpoint um, as the future, future of the watershed. So this is a diagram by Gregorio Rios, president of the association, communal leader uh, from San Pedro de Casta of the forgotten systems and resources of water sowing. So from this statement, we understand that the implementation of the system is also work of remembering. Um, Rio speaks of the work of the Asociación as the implementation of a new structure following the tracers of the ancient ones, siguiendo las huellas de los antiguos. 
See, we see how water enters and infiltrates underground. So the territory in terms of water sowing and harvesting is understood as the different interconnected ecosystems in the same basin of, or sub-basin with its present, past, and potential headwaters. A trained eye can identify the traces of the infrastructure where water used to be harvested and sown. And these traces are also traces of ancestral practices for the use and maintenance of water infrastructure. So the identification of these traces points to an abundance that lies latent in the mountains. And water sowing and harvesting is learned is taught and learned by walking with and listening to the paths of the water from the moment it arrives from the clouds. In the context of our climate crisis and the specific challenges posed by this particular ecosystem characterized by cycles of flood and drought, listening to and walking the ways of the water is a vital strategy for a deep engagement with the territory through an opening up in the words of Anat Singh here, I quote her, an opening up of the curiosity that seems to me the first requirement for collaborative survival in precarious times. So the interdisciplinary practitioners uh, at uh, the Asociación de Siembra y Cosecha de Agua come from many different places and are brought together by this common concern. Um, and this is what's valuable for me. Um, so walking and listening the ways of the water um, in the process of writing the very necessary technical reports for constructing infrastructure. There's a first moment of diagnosis, um, which often arises from like educational activities where people present their relationship with the project uh, at hand to each other. These are often creative activities like putting a play or drawing a map. And social cartography has a very long tradition. And as a member of ASICA, I'm interested in contributing uh, to this with focusing on field recording uh, for its unique ability of bringing walking and listening together. So my mapping, my mapping workshop proposal would be sort of in the form of uh, intergenerational workshops centered on walking with and listening to the paths of the water. Uh, my role would be to sort of offer, offer techniques related to field recording and the facilitation of long sessions of walking and listening, um, leading to the eventual development of collective forms of archiving the material. And the intent with these workshops is to engage in an acoustic ecology, that is this Hildegard Westerkamp, pioneer of the field rights, an arena for the study of the interrelationship between sound, nature, and society. So this comes from a tradition of soundscape composition that Westerkamp helped inaugurate. The compositions are made by putting together sound walks and field recording sessions. Um, and this interrelation of walking and listening in soundscape composition is what interests me. And the proposal here for a sonic map aims though to decenter the sort of explicitly gendered and implicitly racialized separation of human subjectivity imbued in the canonical practice of soundscape composition and composers here can attest to this. Um, and do something more in accordance with uh, what Ana Maria Ochoa writes about the influence of post-structuralist anthropology in sound studies. I'm quoting Ochoa at length. This is not an issue of how to include the human in the environment, but rather of asking how the given and the made are conceptualized and thereby related to the reformulation of notions of production, habitation, the acoustic and form. So when recording in the field, the headphones can be used to hear what is being recorded as it happens. This state of amplified hearing informs movement on site in particular ways. Paying attention to the challenges and potentials of walking with recording hand not only offers mobility, but also makes the physical presence of a body an unavoidable part of the recording. The movement of the headphone cable, friction from clothing, footsteps on the soil and stone, breath sounds that indicate the pace of the body and so on. A masterful approach to field recording would demand that these mentioned traces should disappear in order to maintain a sort of seamless aesthetic flow of environmental sounds separated from any indication of the recording human. And in a gesture of mastery of non-mastery, bringing Nick Tosig here in mind, um, I encourage experimentation with movement-based approaches as a way of understanding that in recording, the operator too becomes part of the record. 
And embracing the interruptions of touch and motion, of breathing and walking creatively is a way to begin to suspend the separation of the given and the made, understanding gesticulation, sensibilities, the archive and the territory as mutually constitutive. Water sowing and harvesting are studied by walking up to the mountain peaks and following the descending paths of the water, learning how to read the inscription of the soil and the stones, the traces of dams, channels, and caves. And in proposing to connect with this practice through sonic mapping, listening takes place in motion while walking while recording as a way of mapping the space from within, cartography from habitation. Um, so, in, um, where am I? <laughs> in working with the Asociación de Siembra y Cosecha de Agua, uh, the intervention of sonic cartography proposed emphasizes in this interconnectedness of habitation mapping, archiving, and constructing. The aesthetic experience of amplified hearing opens channels of communication with the territory. A dimension of this is made reproducible by field recording and is accordingly available to be shared by collective study. The methods of editing, formatting, and ordering the recordings alongside the communication of the experience of recording constitute the map, which stands as an archive that has the capacity of directly informing the shape of the infrastructure to be built. So maps are made of lines, and with sounds, this material is quite literally in a timeline. A single field recording is a line in time, a trajectory walked with its chances and choices. And the sonic map begins when bringing these walks together. Um, and so to conclude, I wanna offer a, fragments of a line from our recording, the recording trip we did last April, uh, edited together with minimal overlaps that give a sense of continuity, as well as rough, rough cuts and examples of like in, in, in recording leveling, just to present them as their conditions of fragments of an archive. Um, so for those who are present, these recordings are remarkable memory aids, uh, giving a sort of visceral as well as technical sense of what it was like to walk down the paths of the water. And they become a living archive, linking our movements to those of the hydrological system. Uh, the water in the beginning is nowhere to be heard. Uh, as the walk started amid the sort of cochas and sm smaller wells where water is either still or infiltrating deep underground. So there's no hydrophones yet. So, so far the silence is of the water. Um, what is heard is the movement around it of birth ga birds ga gathering, of small organisms breathing in the shallows, of humans walking and mapping and talking. And as our paths descend, the water infiltrates a recording with its motion dripping and running through underground channels and overground streams. So what is left now is to share, <laughs> to keep on walking and listening to the ways of water sowing and harvesting and to sustain the living archive that is latent in the territory. Um, so for sharing the audio, I'm gonna stop sharing screen and um, do this through QuickTime just so that uh, we can hear it better. And yeah, here I, I ask you to, the, the levels are a bit uh, low, so I ask you to please listen hard. Jordi llama un cocha. Un cocha. Lo que tiene la capacidad volumétrica para una cocha. No? Um, I, I think it doesn't sound anymore. You can hear it? Not, not anymore. I heard like five seconds and then it went away. Yes, there. How about now? Pero en profundidad también están fisurados. Entonces tú tiras agua ahí y el agua se va hasta el fondo y alimenta las cavernas. Y luego se llena el río. Entonces la cosa es dirigir el agua hacia allá. 
Sí, pero entonces no tiene nada que ver con un canal, ¿no? O sea, ¿por qué ese tipo se confundió con la MUNA y canal? Es que como no, no hay terminología no. específica, no hay, o sea, no hay. puedes sí, decirle sí. lo que quieres. A ver, ve solo el canal y piensa de que el canal es la MUNA. Por eso, pero eso no quiere decir de que el canal, si no está impermeabilizado, no hay filtro. ¿Ya? Pero la cosa... Pero esto no va a almacenar más de 100.000 100, metros cúbicos. No. Porque filtra el toque. No, está bien que filtra. Su volumen es menos de 100.000. Son coches. De 100.000 para arriba son las lunas. Hasta un millón. De millones para arriba son represas. It's stopped, right? No, I'm good. A couple minutes more. Registration. Este tipo debe ser abajo. No por acá. No por acá. No por las paredes. Es al lado. Ya. La registración la debemos ver, pero abajo. Esto es bien. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Beret. That was uh, really wonderful. And what we are going to do is to continue with the two uh, next lectures. But um, if you have like a, a comment for this lecture, you can just like drop it in the chat, and we will take a look uh, at, at it later. So now we will continue with Daniela Avellar and uh, her amplified echo. Uh, her piece was an amplified echo, a carbonated resonance. And Daniela Avellar is a researcher, writer, and DJ based in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She graduated in psychology before gaining a master's degree in contemporary studies of the arts at the Universidade Federal Fluminense. Currently a member of the doctorate program in media and cultural study studies at the Universidad Federal do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Ms. Avellar frequently writes for academic and independent publications as well as for exhibition and is co-curator in the independent space Refresco of an artistic residency program in Rio de Janeiro's port area and the Latin American sound art exhibition Soma Rumor. 2019. Uh, so, uh, Daniela, you, uh, I leave the floor to you. It is a pleasure to be here. And um, my paper, an amplified echo uh, carbonated resonance, was a performative writing thinking about fermentation, sound, and thinking about the possibility of a multi species soundscape. And I think I'm going to read the paper, maybe some of 
the parts of the paper. And I don't know, maybe it's better if I share the, the file. Uh, you, you can you can read yeah uh, you can read uh, if if you like or okay but um, I think I'm, I'm going to share the file oh, okay okay with the text okay cool it's better. You, you, your your volume is a little bit low so if you can speak up that will be great oh yes of course better now yes better okay it is good <laughs> Speaking louder. Yes. So. Is it good like that? Can you read? Yes. Yes. The first part it's called multi species soundscape and effective echo. So I began with two citations of NFC. Our tools of analysis block our ability to see our objects. Material responds to material not just to us, and I think. It is always good to open up a text with a soluble dilemma or with a mystery. With the words presented here, I try to dance or to sing a song, at least to align my movements with my objects of choice, produce entanglements and begin to search together. Of course, to be fair to, do, to those reading this paper, I should explain what this is about. So let me try. I believe that where there is air, there is sound. I also believe that there is always something else sounding while we hear. If we focus on one sound, try this now. There is something more there that affects our listening. Sound is always layered in sounds over sounds. In these lines, I will try to tell you a story conducted by listening and also conducted, as John Cage desired, by the songs we miss, inspired by the noises we cannot hear, the sounds that we have never had the chance to listen to due to the limitations of our human interface, which is why we miss them. Just like Cage's beloved spores and their sibilant music. Here we face hearing as a tool that can be used to perceive things. Through sounds, we can recognize the difference between hot and cold or the intensity of a rainy day. Nature is always singing. Every animal is a sound maker, including me and probably you. A few days ago, I heard this discussed on the Future Ecologies podcast, the, the Nature of Sound. It is important to note that some of these paper's references come from podcasts. To write about sound is to be open to what can be transmitted orally. To explore this more deeply, the question is not just about the position of hearing and orality in comparison with the visual domain in the eye. As Sueli Honik puts it, we could think about communication as not being the sole way to guide our existence. In this line, in, in this light, sound is always a road to understanding the, wor the world and capture its signals, thinking about the effects of sounds on our body that go beyond cognitive attributes. That is to say, sound is always relational. It connects with the series of encounters that constitute being alive, encounters between people, things, landscapes, ideas, works of art, political situations, and others. This kind of friction produces changes in our diagram of forces, producing different effects that open up new ways to feel, to see, and to hear. These encounters affect us. Relations are mediated by language. But what I'm, I'm seeking to achieve here is a text that rejects logocentrism and wants to traverse affect intuition, thinking about subject beyond the individual and listening beyond 
its physiological aspects or cochlear patterns as the important work of Seth Kingford. To listen is to be at the encounter with another, another that is always different. This is my reason for starting with a profound dilemma because the other or the object does not exist outside ourselves, but within. When we talk about communication and cognition, it is true that we seek a common language, something familiar. Sueli Honig tells us, however, that we might think of an experience outside the subject and its supposed interiority, yet the other effectively lives within us by the way of effects. This experience is part of an intensive resonance, a term we will explore later in more depth. As Enet Singh points out, referring to bacteria as the other, the example may seem random, but it's not random at all, as we'll see. 90% of our cells are bacteria. They are with us and we need them. Our bodies become with them. We are because of them. Moreover, this changes how we think about human action in the world. How can we act as we do if we do not include the other species that makes us? I said I came here to tell your story. A story is always fictitious. I like to think we would, with Ursula K. Le Guin that storytelling can be a way to tell you about and collect the stuff of living. Fiction can be less about the triumph of a hero or the story of a hunter and a friend. Le Guin tells us that before the weapon, before a gun, there was a bag, a container, a net, a sex to reunite questions. I discovered Le Guin's stories through reading Donna Harris' work. I use her words here to try to describe the movement I am scoring here. In these lines, I seek to make in a sympoietic way, as sympoiesis is a simple word. It means making with. Nothing makes itself. Nothing is really autopoietic or self-organizing. In the words of the Inupiate computer word game, earthlings are never alone. That is the radical implication of sympoiesis. Sympoiesis is a word proper to complex, dynamic, responsive, situated, historic, historical system. It is a word for worlding with in company. Fermentation is a col collaborative practice that positions us in a process of cooperation with more than human beings. We need, we are co-participants in a movement of microbiological transformations that is markedly interspecies. As Anat Singh indicates, these transformations are what is important for life on Earth, located at a distance from the arborescent decisions of independent and private subjects, relating to Runic's ideas. They consist of stories that develop through contamination, transforming encounters into events. Every gathering in this case is therefore bigger than the sum of two parts. Fermentation is also an activity capable of preserving while simultaneously transforming food, contributing to a less pasteurized and homogeneous consumption. I like to think with Lauren Fournier that fermentation is also an exercise, exercise of futurity, another term to which we will return later. I'm just filling my bag with terms and ideas. The story continues telling you that I have been practicing fermentation with an old friend and have discovered new ways to eat, cook, follow a recipe, pass the time, smell, and listen. We often film ourselves with our hands in action, and alongside the juicy images, we also perceive the sounds that are typical of the action of bubbles formed by an encounter between good bacteria and the right measure of sugar or salt the ingredients that scare the dominance of evil colonies. The carbon dioxide in question produces sound reverberations that sometimes border on the inaudible, just as the existence of microorganisms organisms belongs to the order of the invisible. On a specific day, although maybe my friend does not even remember, and this is simply the obsessive fetish of sound researchers, we perceive a sound that could only be heard by the cell phones recorded and was not directly audible to our human ears alone. We listened into these sounds only later, just after it had been captured. The situation had me thinking for days about questions such as, 
what are the vibration noises of fermentation? How does this sound articulate its power to disrupt our colonial and normative ways of eating, as well as how we perceive the world and relate to each other? Does sound research create evidence or build an empirical world from, li from listening? It is true that soundscape are always leaving their places of orange behind, transforming an object into an event. In the same way, I believe that fermentation transforms food, prolonging it into a future, another temporal conception, while also, as said before, preserving it. Both cases are an extension of singularities in difference, like a carbonated echo where the signal drags or spreads. What is that sound? That is also have the power to dismantle our more stratified ways and ideas. What kind of listening is involved in this scenario of performative gesture? One way to enter this kind of movement, even though with the difficulties, and therefore always trying not to capture the material through a sole or two human comprehension, is to follow Bernie Krause's idea about biophony. Krause was one of the invited researchers who spoke with future ecologists. When I was writing these books and trying to describe what I was, I was hearing, what I found was, is there is a tremendous paucity of language to describe what we hear because we are a visual culture. So there is a lot of material described with the visual, but almost none, just aren't very many words to describe what we hear. So I took the idea of Murray Schaefer's soundscape, which is all the sound that reaches our ear and in working with kids, I have to ask them when they went outside, listen to sound. What were the sources of those different sounds? Are they mechanical sources? Are they human sources? Are they natural so sources? What are the, the ways in which these sounds appear to you? How do you describe them? And so at one point in the late 90s, I introduced the term biophony, meaning the natural sounds that we hear the collective sounds that we hear from a particular habitat. But it's just the natural sounds. It's not anything else. It's all the bird sounds and insects, mammals, amphibians, and so on. About landscapes, and it seems says that we often use this term to imagine a backdrop for a human action. However, if we, will, if we worry about habitability, we will have to figure out how to make landscapes animated and the protagonists of, how, of our stories. Singh says that we need landscapes, specialized, specialized enactments of livability, and that her landscapes are a multi-species moods, enactments of the possibilities of living together. Can we think about a multi-species soundscape? Of course we do. We must. If Singh reacts to an idea of a landscape that slips between the unpredictable and the gathering of organisms, how can we fail to consider an idea of landscape that is not attached to the question of the visual? Between Krause's biophony and the notion of polyphony, and at Singh creates a good score. Polyphony in, is music in which autonomous melodies intertwine. In Western music, the madrigal and the fugue are examples of polyphony. These forms seem archaic and strange to many modern listeners because they were superseded by music in which a unified rhythm and melody holds the composition together. In classical music that replaced Baroque, unity was the goal. This was progress in exactly the sense I have been discussing, a unified coordination of time. In 20th century rock and roll, this unity takes the form of a strong beat, hinting at the listening heart. We are used to listening music with a single perspective. When I learned polyphony, it was revelation. I was forced to pick out separate simultaneous melodies and to listen for the moments of harmony and dissonance they create together. This kind of noticing 
is just what is needed to appreciate the multiple temporal rhythms and trajectories of the asymbolic. A dance floor is a certainly a good place for encounters. However, let us forget the four beat rhythm for a while and allow space for a concert of experimental noise. This situation is a better scene against which to think about the kind of encounter and ethic described above. Alternatively, we could simply think about a group of people engaged together in, ferment, in the fermenting process. When we are at my friend's kitchen fermenting food, it is difficult to choose a soundtrack. We usually handle our visible companies with a just little conversation, talking about the week's events and like topics in gentle voices. If we, if we follow John Cade's example and equalize both sounds and music, we could say that conversation is a way to compose a sound piece. We also know that when fermenting food from the perspective of the sonic events, one should expect that inaudible or low frequency sounds are part of the polyphony that is present. A multi-species soundscape that involves different forms of life being together, perceiving each other. As we finish our fermentation activities, I ask myself what I have heard. It is never a simple question and there is no right answer. To pose this question to myself is to reconstitute it repeatedly. There is no representational paradigm for the signals. The object always returns the dilemma. It is like the listening protocol sessions from artistic collective Ultra Red, whose works are more about hearing compositions than sound compositions. The activist group began investigating and creating in the 90s in parallel with the HIV acceptance movements and its struggle against homophobia and other social oppressions. Tato Taborda, referring to Davi Lapujad ideas, talk, talks about the use of the term sympathy to account for a movement in which observer and object coincide and vibrate in synchronism and the incandescent core of the meaning of the observed object, a core inaccessible by any other method of approximation. There is a certain vibration within the core of the object, a dissonance. That is why the beat is not a good metaphor here. There is a inaudible vibration inside the kimchi container or the kombucha jar. The object then reveals itself as an object subject. subject. Endowed with the petals with which, in a flash instant, unlike any score, the observer's petals coincides and merges, vibrating with it instantly and violently commotion. In the glow of the privileged instant in each intuition occurs, we sympathize with matter insofar as we apprehend it as pure movement. Part two. Recipes are open scores. Today, our topping is carp, made with into small brown nuggets. It is tantalizing rich and spice, and I ask how it is made. Pam Soy explained, you have fish, you add salt. She falters, that's it. I image myself in the kitchen with a raw salty fish dripping in my hand. Language has met its limit. The trick of cooking is in the bodily performance, which is not easy to explain. The same is true for mushroom picking, more dense than classification. It is a dance that partners here with many dance lives. And I remember a, a teacher who taught me raw food classes at the university with a very political perspective. She said, oh, do you want, to, do you want me to give you a recipe? The recipe is... Take the banana, peel the banana, that's it. I also remember my mother when I tried to ferment yogurt at home for the first time. In this case, it's, it's not just about the relation with the recipe. I tried to follow the recipe like a hermetic score. I had almost forgotten that my mother, like my grandmother, had fermented things throughout my life, using only the intuition as a guide. Fermentation seems to lead us to handle recipes like open spores. The notation is something less representational and more connected to a direction to action. If it says to you, act, 
then let us peel the banana. Until now, we have looked at ways to encounter and handle objects that can be channeled through sympathy. Remember what I said about resonance? With the open score, we can ask ourselves if the principle that guides the kind of relation we are discussing here is not the echo, but the resonances of sympathy. If resonance, as Tato Taborda puts it, it's spontaneous and caused by frequency affinities, acoustic or affective and subjective to return to, to a unique, it refers to a mutual cycle. Resonance, resonance encompasses an encounter between two bodies that is more than the sum of the parts. It is also a mode of relation that activates ways of being and individual and collective vibrations that connect us to the forces of life, helping us to do worlds between us and the food we ferment. There is more mode of relation than merely two agents facing each other. We make ourselves vibrate. The cabbage, the salt and bacteria all have their own voices and scores, but this is scores inhabit us somehow latently. If we think about resonance between two humans, we could think about different languages and gestures that create vibrations from two voices, cre creating space. This is un unlike the echo, when an input implies a wave that propagates until rest. An echo only repeats the original messages. Bodies, whether human or more than human, when in resonance, produce modulation since participating in a different process of sound propagation. Of course, when we allow ourselves to be grasped by identifiable frequencies, Taborda says that in the case of an echo, bodies act like conductive vehicles that move the fragments, but without making displacements, resulting in a passive relation. Meanwhile, Brandon LaBelle reminds us that the dub mix of reggae has delays and echoes as central aspects. The sonic structure presents rhythms and tonalities that makes us think about itinerant lives and migration, like forces of resistance in a sense that dislocates through remixes, oranges in, flavor, in favor of flexibility and transience. Resilience and displacement. Brenda Labelle says, says, from within the electronic delays saturating the music, one may detect the exact arrival of a type of purification. According to a logic of displacement, of singularity always being prolonged into repetitions of not quite the same, delays are not duplications. Rather, they spiral in, in and around orange, mutating as they go. From within this echo world, reggae culture constructs a form of wholeness. When thinking about the migration of sound, practice of diversity, diffraction, and echo form in the face of the logics of Western colonial capitalism, as LaBelle suggests, a type of archipelagic imaginary by which to scourge the grip of the colonial hand. We can transform our soundscape metaphor again, since we can now think not only about the Jamaica sound system, but can also look to the practice of sampling. We must begin to think about rap and hip hop songs in which language seems less immutable as violent forces consolidated. In this kind of music, there is a flow, an energy, that reverberates in something that vibrates through repetition. Third and last part. The, fle the fleeting and punctuated event of sound is one of the transients and transition, an itinerant and migratory sensorial matter. Sound is both a thing of the past and a signal of the future. It points toward what has happened. For every sound is an index of an event that, by the time we hear, has already transpired, while equally pulling us forward by echoing beyond toward a distance over there. 
the articulated presence of any sound at one and the same moment is to be found in its disappearance and its becoming. Brandon Labelle. Here, I kinship with the artist and my friend, Jonas Van, who talks on the Fera Livre podcast in the episode Epistemologias do Gesto, or Epistemology of Gesture, about a refusal, a refusal in relation to the separation between bodies and matter. He seeks an ecology, for lack of a better term, that does not measure up to an ecology centered on the white, male, and cisgender subject. This kind of practice denies forms of life, worldings, and imposes on us a certain ways of dealing with time. Fermentation places us in another relation with temporality. It is a way to reconnect with practices that have been silent and make them louder. It is a way of reclaiming. I often talk with Jonas about fermentation. On this podcast, he, say, he says that fermentation is something that happens all the time because we are transmuting matter and energy all the time. And this time doesn't fit the linear chronological model. Things do not necessarily have an end, but we must die somehow to live. When you presuppose rootness, things recreate life. It is like that with fermentation, sometimes. We made a lot of kimchi out of cabbage, also as an exercise in futurity. Yesterday, Jonas Van wrote me about a dream he had. We were together inside something similar to a time machine that have vibrations in his dream that inhabit me in latency. Yes, our ability to hear our objects must still face a thick and misty cloud created in part by the difficulties of our methodological apparatus. Nevertheless, it is no use not to try or to insist on a hermetic and mute relationship. I cannot just read things and tell you aesthetically what I have learned. I tell stories as I try to write, to talk or to sound like someone who is excited about something new and about a new life appearing. It is a vibrant matter. The world, my bag, these lines are full of such matter, like the kombucha that grows in my kitchen now. Maybe like me, you, my computer, a cat that stares at me, scores for us all to become with. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow, that was really great. Um... Um, so now we go to Anna and uh, uh, so Anna's uh, piece is Resounding Epistemologies of Conflict and Realities in Colombia's Historical Memory. So Anna Ruiz Valencia is a Colombian curator, musician and researcher interested in contemporary artist practices particularly those related to oral culture, philosophy, and politics of sound. As a violinist, her work focuses on experimental music and improvisation, frequently collaborating with musicians, writers, and artists in Colombia and abroad. Ruiz Valencia co-authored Charler, Freger, Cimarron, Freedom, and Masquerade, Thames Hudson, 2019, and was part of the curatorial team at the 45 Salon Nacional de Artistas in Colombia. Ruiz Valencia currently serves as curator at the Universidad de Antioquia's Museum, MUA, and Auditum Festival in Medellín, Colombia. Uh, so, uh, Ana, I leave the... Thank you, Alejandra, Thank you. for the presentation. Give me one sec. Can you see my screen? Yes.
In 1985, the radio broadcast all across Colombia the police of Alfonso Reyes Echandia, president of the Supreme Court of Colombia, as he spoke live on national radio from a telephone under his desk in the Palace of Justice, while gunshots were heard in the background. The building was occupied by the M19 guerrilla group and attacked by grenades and gunshots by Colombian military forces, with nearly 350 hostages held inside. The president did not answer any of the desperate phone and radio calls by Reyes Echandia, who died with other 93 people. So the bloody conflict that has taken place in Colombia throughout the 20th and the 21st centuries is partially the result of the conflict from the colonial period of civil wars inherited from the 19th century and in recent decades of the so-called war on drugs. So all these result in the breeding ground for internal conflict and political instability. Oral memory is constituted by a complex network of listening perspectives and sonic stimuli mediated, for instance, by mass media or by art and music. So I propose to understand the oral component of Colombian conflict from various perspectives. One would be the construction of memory through mass media, such as radio, but also the use of audio recordings, as well as testimony and subjective narration as a dimension of symbolic re uh, reparations and works of art that question official narratives by using sound as both a strategy and material for resisting and deconstructing meta narratives and uh, the practice of listening as a political act in the creation of other possible worlds. So the archival material that we're going to listen to is available on the internet. The rights belong to radio stations like Caracol or RSN or to the National Sound Archive. Uh, I've written the credits in each case if you want to look uh, for it. Um, the other narrative audio that you're going to listen is not archival material. It's my own transformed voice. Uh, first act, uh, 1948. On April 9, 1948, the radio played a central role in the popular uprising, later called El Bogotazo. Jorge Eliezer Gaitán, a left-wing political leader and presidential candidate for the Liberal Party, was assassinated. This provoked an uprising that led to hundreds of deaths and the destruction of a significant part of downtown Bogotá. It may have been the first time that radio truly connected all Colombians around a single event. Liberal leaders from the Junta Central Revolucionaria de Gobierno, Central Revolutionary Government Junta, broke into the national broadcaster, took microphones away from journalists, and called for the insubordination of government forces all over Colombia. Radio broadcasters from downtown Bogotá reported on the events with higher and all over the country, the news spread like wildfire through local and underground broadcasters that operated handmade equipment. All of them informed the public about the Gaetan assassination while encouraging resistance, coordinating attacks on institutions, and reporting dubious revolutionary victories against the conservative president Mariano Ospina Perez. <laughs> Servicio de la Revolución, transmitiendo desde un lugar de la República que a nadie le importa. Pueblo liberal de Colombia, la suerte está echada. No debemos de retroceder un solo instante. El gobierno de Ospina Pérez está tambaleando. Nuestro movimiento se suspende cuando damos la cabeza de Ospina Pérez rodando por las calles de Bogotá. A la carga liberales de Colombia, a la carga. No es cierto que el ejército esté con el gobierno conservador. Podemos informar que a pesar de la orden dada desde Palacio para que la motorización del ejército avaleara y masacrara al pueblo liberal de Bogotá, el ejército se reveló y está de parte de la revolución. En este momento, Bogotá está en llamas y en poder del pueblo liberal, del ejército liberal y de la policía liberal. So, El Bogotazo revealed the power of radio in processes of popular uprising, as these pirate radio stations played a central role in popular organization and had both direct and indirect impact on the armed mobilization that followed Gaitán's assassination all over the country. But it also revealed 
the state's inability to control radio bandwidth. So after the Bogota, so several reforms limited bandwidth access to small transmitters, such as community or amateur broadcasters, who were not connected to larger business structures. So this, uh, this work uh, by Lionel Vasquez, Radio Spectros, is a traveling radio device that plays recorded radio broadcasts from April 9, 10, and 11, 1948, mixed with music and radio dramas from the same period. Here, a central idea is that of the sound as a physical and public space, limited by the state's policies of bandwidth allocation because it cannot exceed a certain area to broadcast the sound material. So Lionel creates situations to listen to this archival audio in public spaces. He gives radios to passersby to listen to this mobile radio station. Uh, you, you can see some of the radios here or here. This is Lionel. Um, and then they talk about these recordings and how they have shaped history. The second uh, event would be in 1985. It's November 6, 1985. Bus drivers in Bogota turned up the volume on their radios as their passengers listened to it. Surprise! While the families of those who worked in the headquarters of the Supreme Court followed the events minute by minute from their homes. The M19 Guerrilla Group had entered the building and taken the magistrates, workers, and visitors hostage. Now the army and the police surrounded the building and were beginning an operation to retake it, which would last until the next day. The process of retaking the building left nearly a hundred dead, including civilians, armed forces, and guerrilla fighters, and at least 11 missing persons whose disappearances remain unresolved. están los magistrados de la Corte Suprema de Justicia, todo el personal administrativo que está aquí. No me preguntes detalles, pregúntame por lo que la nación necesita, la búsqueda de una solución. Pregúntame por lo que la nación hoy está esperando. Que un presidente que traicionó una nación responda con la nación. Aquí hemos venido a buscar un presidente que le falló a la patria, que traicionó los acuerdos que él firmó. Todo aquel que firma un convenio debe responder por lo que se compromete en el convenio. Y para la patria el presidente fue inferior. So the radio stations, as, as we hear here, broadcast live calls from hostages inside the palace. As we heard, these broadcast audios are multidimensional. Not only are the interviewees' voices heard in the foreground, but the voices of the guerrillas, echoing bursts of gunfire and explosions are also heard in the background. Time is an important dimension too. Um, as the day wears on, the conversations become more agitated the gunshots louder, and pleading voices are heard shouting, don't shoot. So towards the end of the first day, the country's main radio stations received a call, a telephonic call from Noemi Zanin, the communications minister, ordering them to interrupt their transmissions and broadcast a soccer match instead. In parallel to all this, Pablo Montaña, a blind musician and radio aficionado who lived just a few blocks from the palace, intercepted conversations between the military commanders of the operation to retake the pass. And realizing that this contained important information, he recorded uh, several cassettes until noon of November 7. These cassettes were hidden for many years. Mm. This work by Esteban Ferro, is called Llamado de Guerra, Archivo Sonoro del Conflicto, and it is an archive of key moments in the political conflicts of Latin America, in which radio and audio recordings have played an important role. So one of the events addressed by Ferro would be the, the Palace of Justice Siege, and Ferro deconstructs these events in a series of transmissions, performances, listening sessions, and print publications. Three aspects I, I think are particularly interesting. One is the construction of a fictional narrative based on reenactment because performers bring the past and the present together by interacting with dead voices uh, from the original recordings, uh, but also by including elements related to the present, such as bubuselas in the match, uh, in the soccer match section. Another one would be the development of the script score uh, in which the analysis of radio 
um, stories is translated into a series of notations. We can see that here. Um, we can see like a timeline and different, uh, it, it, it works as a score. Uh, and also the final performative and sonic action per se, which involves the combination of archival material, incidental sounds, constructed text and live speech. So the difficulty of obtaining the original radio, uh, radio recordings became an opportunity to understand how media discourse, in this case radio, um, is built. So Ferro uses production strategies that include, for example, the creation of scripts, as we saw, the broadcast of live interviews and soundscapes, and the use of sound effects, uh, Foley sounds, music, and live and pre-recorded sound design techniques. For example, here, uh, Angela Marcial is a sound artist and Foley artist, is making the incidental noises. So both uh, Ferro and Vasquez work deconstruct the sonic narratives through a mixture of fiction and nonfiction. Uh, and also, this is very important, they demand the active listening from the public. So I'd like to use Jesus Martin Barbero's uh, term mediations, mediaciones, which is like these ever-evolving interactions between the media and the listeners. So as historical events develop, listeners construct a subjective existence in relation to those events that also exert an influence on subsequent discursive outputs by mass media. So it is not at a unidirectional process. Um, this second act is related to another oral dimension of the conflict. So related to stories uh, that have to do with systematic violence, such as displacement, massacres, or forced disappearance that are sometimes recorded not by mass media outlets, as we saw in, this case, in the last case, but as part of criminal court cases of transitional justice or symbolic reparations. So in Maria Alejandra Ordoña's sound installation, Retratos No Hablados, uh, exhibited in, the, in Bogota, the Center of Memory, Peace and Reconciliation in 2016, visitor uh, answer telephones that ring randomly and reproduce intimate stories about the mourning of close friends or relatives of the disappeared. So the use of telephones on the one hand creates a close relationship between the listener and the victim, but also establishes a distance because it is impossible to respond to the message uh, you're hearing. Also the selection of the telephone as an object connects with the artist's family history uh, because her grandfather asked his family to ensure that the line was always open in place in case they received a phone call from her disappeared uncle. This work, Paisajes Invisibles, by Colectivo Radio Laboratorio, uh, Sandra Jaramillo and Mauricio Prieto, was a mobile and collapsible structure, a bicycle-like vehicle that transported plastic tubes uh, that were installed in public spaces to create a temporary space in which passersby were interviewed by the artist. So they departed from this idea that the landscape can be narrated, recalled, and mostly reconstructed through oral history, despite having disappeared due to conflict. So with the support of local organizations, visitors were invited to think about sound marks from the places they were displaced from and imitate or describe them so that these memories could be recreated, to be remixed and amplified. So Paisajes in Invisibles was organized around a mechanism for editing and publishing audio material. And the insertion of this material into public space aimed to bring people together to exchange memories and replay this resulting, let's say, like memory soundscapes. Uh, here, another picture of it. And also another work by Lionel Vasquez. Again, uh, there are two installations that, I, that are very uh, similar. One is the Canto de los Yarumos and Canto Silentes en Cuerpos de Madera. They use voice recordings, soundscapes, and the chants of victims' relatives to stress listening as a political act and as a central part of the dialogue surrounding reconciliation and symbolic reparation. So the first piece that is the one we see here 
uh, was installed in the tree, uh, in the three Jarumo trees. Jarumo is a very long tree with big leaves on the top, planted by victims at the Bogota Center for Memory, Peace and Reconciliation. And the second one was created in the town of Santo Domingo in Arauca as part of the symbolic reparations after the Colombian government was condemned by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for the massacre that it perpetrated against this community. So in both cases, Vasquez relates corporeal and tactile experience by placing transducers on the roots of the trees using the mechanical conduction of sound through the tree trunks to propose a form of listening that is based on physical contact as we see in this image. So he worked with victims through some questions like, what should we learn from these events? And mostly what to say to someone who might want to reconnect with these experiences. So all this resulted in very intimate answers that were made up of poems, songs, and stories that were directed to the listener. So all these works uh, that we just talked about, Ordóñez, Vázquez, Radio Laboratorio, share the focus on the anti-monumental and the notion of intimacy. Um, both Vázquez and Radio Laboratorio, for example, emphasize the anti-monumental as a fundamental axis for working in spaces of collective mourning and put the, the listening experience as a multi-dimensional experience that implies temporal, corporeal, tactile, and very importantly, emotional layers. These installations dialogue with the physical and the social sp space they inhabit. So Radio Laboratorio, for example, they use temporary pop-up actions in public spaces, while Vasquez boosts the symbolic meanings of materials, in this case, wood, and places, uh, creating subtle and very intimate listening ex experiences that go beyond the acousmatic. And intimacy in the case of Ordoñez of Maria Alejandra is also fundamental, although explored from a different point, uh, more like from a nostalgic perspective and from the bodily experience emerging from an interaction with certain types of telephones. The telephones he, she uses are were very common in the 90s, for example. And they also understand memory as a subjective process based on open stories, non-definitive, and created in direct dialogue with uh, victims. The third act um, here is related to longer historical processes. And I wanted to go from the specific to the large, let's say. And the work of Carlos Castro and Fabio Melesio Palacios um, is important here because they connect the violence of the colonial past with contemporary processes of exclusion. So I want you to, to see this. Mm, this is a map of downtown Bogota. And right next to each other, three powers within the history of Colombia converge. So here we see the church, the Basilica del Voto Nacional, the national bow, also the state, uh, the headquarters of the national armies recruiting common, but also drug traffic. Here, uh, here is the, the Bronx, the city's main illicit drug dispensary that actually before being here was here. This Parque Tercer Milenio used to be El Cartucho, which was uh, this drug dealing uh, space, but also all this place is very institutional. Here's the Museo Santa Clara, the place where Carlos installed uh, his works, but also the Supreme Court of Justice, we just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, the presidential house, the mayor's office, the, the Congress, right? So he works from all this area and installed several pieces here in the Museo Santa Clara. Uh, the first one is this, Capilla Blanca, um, that is a police squad car that replicates the interior decor of the church. Um, so you get uh, in that car and live an experience that it sits somewhere between claustrophobia and confessional. Um, and the visitor listened there to radio broadcasts, to religious songs, to melodies. I mean, it's all like a sonic conveyance. Melodies from the military bands that actually play next to the church at certain times of the day here, like here next to the presidential house. Um, and violent sounds making of knocking in the car. Uh, the next uh, is this called Potencias because Colombia is a very 
predominantly Catholic country, and it's consecrated to, the, to a devotional image of Jesus called the Sacred Heart, a metaphor for suffering and sacrifice. So uh, these um, sculptures features knives that have been confiscated by the police, originally made by hand using found materials, you know, by mostly thieves or like these uh, non-accepted people of the society, you know? So these knives are used to build melodic percussion instruments. So each one plays an individual note on, on, uh, of religious melodies. So by doing so, he updates the meaning of these melodies by contrasting them with these handmade knives that are the only means of defense, actually, for those who are not protected by the police, by the state, or by the dominant religion. A similar uh, operation is done with this, Raiz. Uh, it's a similar strategy, although here he uses the ritual melody of indigenous origins, no Nocelon. Uh, the author is unknown. I want you to listen to a little bit of it. So this uh, earthy sound that you that you can hear, it recalls in the end wind instruments like the kena or the siku. Um, and basically it is made out of bazooka pipes that are used for smoking uh, unrefined coca paste that is called bazooka. Um, and this sound produced by bazooka pipes uh, plus the evoked and the melodies and timbers, it speaks um, to the process of profaning coca. If you think about it, it's, it is a sacred plant for various native cultures in the continent that here is progressively degraded into cocaine and then into bazooka. So placing this sculpture in the church provides a reading of the colonial power imposed on ancestral cultures that subjected the indigenous populations to urban, political, social, and cultural exclusion. So here the, the, the word instrument may be key to in interpreting these works by Cardos, uh, the musical instrument, but also weapons as instruments for defense and protection but also pipes uh, as instruments for consuming narcotics and very much in a wider sense, religion, war, the police, the state, and even music itself as instruments of domestication, of persecution, marginalization, or oppression. Also, Fabio Melesio, the other artist I wanted to talk about, uh, he works with uh, long-term processes defined by a particular geographic, historical, and social context. Um, he comes from the Valle del Cauca uh, that is known for its extensive sugar mills. So this industry is rooted in colonial haciendas that existed centuries ago, uh, with their production originally based on the slave labor. So Fabio uh, was born in Nariño, but moved as a young child to this region when his father found employment as a sugarcane harvester. So during the 19th century, the material base of society passed from enslaved labor to the work of peons and tenants. In the 80s, labor conditions were a little better in the 1980s. Uh, for example, Palacio's father's generation was hired directly by companies that provided benefits for their families. But in the 90s, when Colombia enter, um, enters into the global neoliberal system, uh, this led to precariousness in employment. So workers had no warranty of being hired again every year and lost all the good things they have as being contracted, yeah, contracted by the mills. So Palacio Sound Installation from 2011, BMR from Bamba, Martillo y Refilon that are three types of machetes used by reapers. It is based on the everyday act of sharpening a machete. We can see here, this is the machete and they sharpen it. Um, and here Fabio wanted to pay homage to his father and to vindicate his labor as a sugar cane reaper. So in the in BMR or BMR, hundreds of machetes hang from the ceiling at a height that nearly brushes against the heads of visitors. And it's, uh, this also stages a metallic echoing sound of blades 
that is reproduced in the space. And it, you can even smell also the soot from the burnt cane because these are real machetes. Um, so the sound is a recording of the in situ performance of three reapers sharpening the machetes, the one we saw in the previous images, among them the artist Tatter himself. So I want you to, to listen a bit to this uh, by Fabio. Son como todas esas cosas que están encima de uno que a veces uno no pudiera derrumbar, quitar o, o anular, ¿no? Entonces como que desde el lado de los porteros pues está lo laboral. Uh -huh. Tiene sus herramientas, pero, pero este asunto del, de la contratación, este asunto de la... Como para entrar como en, en, en la síntesis de lo que es el portero, como su contratación, su manera de, de, de día a día su forma de, de cohabitar el espacio, su, su vida cultural, su vida de, de identidad como tal, está amenazada constantemente. Entonces, por eso el asunto como de entrar en un lugar en el cual te encuentras amenazado. Y yo, yo dije, bueno, ahí hay un acto performativo, tengo una instalación, pero la instalación no es suficiente. Entonces, con el acto performativo, se complementa y se convierte en un acto casi que silente, ¿no? Porque no hay una voz, no hay, digamos, no hay un ruido eh, de, de, una, de una boca, pues, por así decirlo, pero sí hay sonido, esos sonidos de una herramienta, entonces como que es ahí en donde, en donde siento que, que, que está como esa fortaleza, ¿no? De ese clamor de los otros que no están, pero el ruido queda en el oído, queda en la mente. Entonces eso retumba en cierta forma, porque cada vez que se escucha el sonido o el ruido de afilar, se va, se los, se va, se va a hacer como un acto de recordación. So, Sapley, Palacios, and Castro's work refer to several layers of culturally and historically charged content through sound. Uh, Palacios recalls a familial inheritance and tradition, but also a society that still maintains ways of operating that are based on extra extractivism and the precarization of labor, bringing to mind the labor of slaves on the colonial haciendas. On the other hand, Carlos Castro establishes uh, a connection between processes of colonization and expulsion and between collective and individual dynamics, such as the users of knives or of the used pipes in these instruments machines. As an epilogue, and this was something that happened after uh, or when I was actually writing the article, is that on April 28th of this year, uh, an unprecedented social upheaval began in Colombia. Uh, the spark for this was a tax reform heavily directed to the middle and lower classes. So at night we heard shoots and the intimidating sounds of helicopters and watched an infinite scroll of videos, you know, mentioning the dates, the times and places of police outbursts that were savage. Uh, and by day the street sounded of Paranagas, I think that's uh, Molotov cocktails and supposedly less lethal gunfire in a loop that triggers um, collective traumas and social traumas within the population. This collective trauma is not only triggered in those who directly experience the war in Colombia, but also in a wider population that has lived with conflict through the media, and this is important, and, but also through the memor memories of family and acquaintances. So I think that understanding the auditory dimension of conflict and critically listening to it uh, and to the past allows us to become aware of our agency in reconstructing the worlds we inhabit, but it also puts into perspective the influence of subjective narrations of mass media and telecommunications in the narratives we tell, the images and sounds we remember, and in the way we construct the present. So I just wanted to finish with this and this that uh, at least in Colombia, there is a lot to listen to here and now. Well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Anna. That was really great. Um, so, and well, 
and I, I was really uh, amazed by the way you put together all these like uh, sound artists and sound pieces because it really tells uh, something ab about like uh, this long history of Colombia's uh, violence and um, yeah, long history of Colombia's violence. And this was especially important this year in 2022 because like the world has been watching uh, Colombia's protest and Colombia's fights against uh, Duque and, uh, and against corruption. So uh, maybe this would be a nice uh, point to start this conversation. Uh, uh, you talk about the uh, the place of the radio and media, and uh, how do you think this has influenced like the protest uh, these years, uh, or h how these uh, practices of sound? Uh, uh, I saw that th there, there were uh, a few sound artists working like uh, uh, in the protest and uh, creating uh, machines and pieces for for this protest. Um, wh what can you tell us uh, uh, about it? Well, I think maybe because we were also like uh, isolated in our homes and, and it was like a very different experience uh, because of the pandemic. Mm, we, or more of us than before, became very uh, aware of what media can do, you know? Like, if we were, uh, if you were into the protests and then you came and, and saw what the television was saying, it was like, uh, this is a completely different reality. But also the difference is that we had uh, social media and social media plus reality plus let's say news or mass media uh, were showing like very different stuff so this thing and, and I can tell that it was not just myself but a huge amount of people uh, were following social media because it was more uh, like true you know like you, you could see like live transmissions and actually some of these people that were transmitting live uh, are accused now of terrorism, for example. So this is this is a, a huge thing to think about, and and also the government realized how the the oral and and the the sound perspective was uh, a thing, you know. So for example, this that that some people that were working with the live transmissions are accused of terrorism right now. Um, I think, yeah, particularly because of the pandemic, a lot of people realized and, and we were, I, I think also has to do that uh, in this time, that, that that's at least my experience, um, we have listened differently because we are, we, we pass more time at home or before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so the thing about the helicopters, you know, like you're, you, at some point I was like, there's no one in the street. Um, I live, I don't know, in a, in a place where is the, that is not close to the protest uh, epicenters, let's say, but you, you saw your window and there was nothing happened, but then all day or at certain moments of the day, the helicopters, like, you know, accusing you of something, I felt like that. Yeah, totally. I mean, um... Uh, this year, I, I realized that this project of the publication began with the pandem <laughs> pandemic, uh, and it was really weird that it, we didn't even address uh, the subject uh, uh, in in both editions. But it, it's it's very like present without like even mentioning, and I always like uh, I also was curious in a brighter note uh, about like because I I thought like that Daniela's and Brit lectures were very much like interrelated, uh, like different pr perspective of um, listening, uh, but very collective uh, uh, practice mm -hmm. of listening. Also, uh, both in imply uh, conversation and listening. Um, in fact, like in the audios we heard from Vert uh, lecture, there was a lot of conversation going on in Spanish. And uh, I was wondering, how, how did you begin uh, these uh, practices of listening within the Asociación de Siembra 
y cosecha and how did these practices change the research and um and yeah how how how, how did you begin with with this uh, how did it change how, what did you discover that was like a, that really changed the perspective of the project And the same question for Daniela, like, uh, how did you, because I have also been like, doing kombucha and stuff, but I, it didn't ha uh, occur to me to begin listening. But in fact, it, yeah, it has like a really a super nice sound that is so um, uh, relaxing in a way, uh, the, the sound of fermentation. You. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start. Um, Yeah, so, sorry for not providing translation. <laughs> um, so what you're basically hearing for people who don't speak Spanish, uh, it's just kind of us walking around discussing the different systems. Like, oh, so that's an infiltration wall. Is that well built? Like, what is this about? And like, what is an Amuna? Um, yeah. Why does this guy think an Amuna is this and it's not that? It's like, well, because there's no standardized terminology for any of this. Um, it's the same with Quechua language and Quechua knowledge in general. There's no standardization um, or there's very little. So it's terms just flow and mean different things for different people. And so this is, yeah, this is a bit of what was going on in the audio. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, the conversation, I think, changed. Yeah, it changes everything. We're constantly in dialogue and we're in dialogue within different registers as our collective um, in dialogue with the community. Uh, which is not a uniform entity, which is uh, also has conflicting interests interests and a lot going on there uh, and dialogue with NGOs that are involved. And so there's all these different registers with the state. Yeah. And, and, and so it, it's about finding different discourses and different and consistency is the hardest part you know, to, to kind of keep yourself consistent. And, and so this is why we keep talking about having an internal dialogue that is strong and having writing um, of ours that, that just kind of we can hold on to and not forget what the work is actually about. Um, and yeah, in my in my sort of individual research, um, yeah, the, the just I, I went up with the recorders uh, for this trip and, and was thinking, I wasn't really thinking about voice uh, that much uh, in, in my research in general as anything that's important. And then it like became one of the main things. And, and I started understanding the voices also of the elements. So the voice of the water in relation to the voice, to our voices and words um, and the importance of words. So, yeah, I don't know. The different registers of dialogue and communication certainly uh, influence me on a personal level in my research and us as a collective uh, constantly. I don't know if that answered. Yeah, yes, totally. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Daniela, what can you tell us uh, uh, about uh, fermentation? About fermentation? <laughs> Yeah how, how did you to... yeah, how did you begin like the practice of listening uh, and fermentation? Um... How do I see listening in relation to fermentation? Something like that. Yeah, you know, how, how did, did, did you begin uh, the practice of listening? Uh, uh, how, uh, how It was did recording. You... Recording, ah, recording and listening. Yeah. Ah, yeah. And then I discovered these inaudible sounds and I thought it was, I don't know, like a revelation of our, our limits in relation to our human Hearing. interface, you know, I began to think. And it's not just about the limitations, but this kind of, this kind of thinking, this comprehension, uh, this human exceptionalism, you know, to think about nature and everything else. In nature in relation to the social, like the human is uh, the, the active part that acts, acts in nature and in the social. Yeah. And I, I don't know, it's not just about the limitation, but, but I begin to think about listening beyond human limitations so yeah. i began to think like vegetable listening and animal listening listening is just a, it's not just a human thing i started to, to think like that 
Yeah, totally. I mean, um, well, as people know, like the or, or like uh, hearing range, like is like this, yeah. and the nature's uh, hearing frequency range is like mm -hmm. there's uh, like always a lot that is happening that we are not uh, really aware of. Uh, we cannot hear uh, a lot of the sounds that animals and uh, nature made, makes because of our uh, hearing device, so to say. But I thought it was quite interesting to approach this, like not to try to listen to this uh, side that we cannot listen anyway, but to try to approach it through a practice of um, of being there and, uh, and and sharing like a space a collective space of talking about something that is happening, right? Um, yeah. Let's see if anyone has a question in the YouTube. Uh, I just I, I just remember <laughs> something because I think uh, the second part of your uh, question, I, I didn't say anything about it, and I think it's important about how artists have approached uh, this yeah. uh, this particular. Um, I don't know, thing happening in Colombia. I think, uh, of course, uh, the field recording is important, but also like, um, for example, the work of Noise Radio uh, from Cali, uh, also Celeste Betancourt here in Medellin or Diana Medina in Bogota. They have been working with, uh, it can be, yeah, um, communicative uh, thing, like, uh, for example, Noise, they work with radio and uh, not only Noise, but many, radio people working all around the country have realized how important it is uh, this is right uh, but also for example um, one work by diana in the center of uh, peace and memory and, re and reconciliation <laughs> mm -hmm. a, i always say it wrong um that is more like an installation that you move and you listen to different things or uh, celeste Tancur that she actually when the uh, protests were like in the maximum point here in Medellin it was very hard uh, also in Cali, Cali was the worst like many dead people and disappeared uh, mm -hmm. in Bogota but uh, here in Medellin she for example she went and and had um, something that happened is that the internet the, the, the government uh, shut down the internet in some specific areas so they hacked the system she is like an amazing coding artist and all this and so they hacked the system with other artists uh, from plato edro uh, the artistic space here in medellin and they trans then they made transmission through radio libre so they have been like also um, taking advantage of this uh, knowledge let's say and to not cut the information you know i think that there is a very important thing about that and noise for example they reconstructed like a chronology of every uh, like or most important thing that were said were said on the media about the Palo nacional the, the national strike mm -hmm. and they uh, started like making performances uh here in medellin in cali like reading this out loud, you know, because you 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 have like very fragmented information depending on what media or what kind of uh, place you are in. Mm, so they kind of uh, condense all that, and when they read it out loud to people to passersby, it becomes like a very potent, a very um, emotional moment. You know, when they did it here, it was like a lot of people in the street like uh, you know shocked uh completely so yeah I, I just wanted to mention that yeah thank you for the for the additional note um yeah, daniela can you talk i like to think listening like a mode of approach like a mode of you know approaching the object so i don't know i think fermentation is not just about health it's not just about what to eat and it's a mode of relation so i think listening is a mode of relation and a mode of approaching the object that i don't know we are a visual culture so yeah. when we look to a, an object we immediately we ask ourselves what we are seeing 
and listening, I don't know, it is another kind of movement and it's not just a body movement, you know, I think it's methodological yeah. almost. Would, would you say that uh, uh, because we are a visual culture, uh, listening can be less normative in a way? Yes, I think. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that because it, it was just sort of how, um, yeah, tech, like the technical reports that are needed for constructing any infrastructure, for getting funding, for getting it approved by the municipality for anything. Are, is necess it's necessary. You need an image, and and you, you sound is never necessary yeah. in like any of these official registers, because um, we're talking about also at least um, in like Anna's um, work as well, the state, you know, the presence of the state and official narratives um, as this thing you're always fighting against, no? And so it's, or, 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 or with, or through, or whatever you're doing with that kind of discourse and media. And so, and so, yeah, I mean, listening just sort of, in a way, and this I find in like everyone's work, like I think it, it was in Daniela's um, presentation, this thing about finding other ways of relating to time or other forms of temporality. And how do you find make space for that? Um, because with the water sowing and harvesting, same. I mean, you it's a big trial and error thing. It depends on the hydric cycles. These are cycles that no one, no official entity ever cares about. Um, and and care and maintenance, because you build with stone. And fermentation is also very much about care. Yeah. Uh, always constantly going in and Um, and in many ways, radio too, no, because it's this fleeting thing you always have to tune back into. So it's, yeah, it's like listening is like, how do you introduce at this, at th these different senses of time um, into the conversation, into the four, right? And bring about everything that that brings about, like memory being an important site of contention and how memory is this thing you're constantly making uh, in the present. So, so yeah, I don't know. All these things are sort of surfacing. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> Anyone totally. have anything to add? I, I totally agree. Uh, that's what, what we are, um, some researchers, I guess. Um, yeah, and, and like, it's, a, it's a bit like the, the, the Brandon Label uh, quote uh, you did in, in your presentation, which is great, that uh, when sun arrives, like, It's already gone because uh, it's the source, and it's related to so sound being s like more slow than like a visual, right? The uh, the movement of the waves. Uh, so, thank you so much for 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 this conversation and for the amazing lectures. I really enjoy listening to them uh, uh, in person <laughs> after reading it. <laughs> And um, no, nothing. Thank you so much for being here, and for anyone that is interested in this uh, little book that we did uh, this year, you can find more information on the web. And thanks, thank you so much to all the people that listen to to bear with us for two hours online. That I know that it's harder than real life, and nothing else. And until uh, until next time. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, Alejandra, thank you. And, and I also wanted to, I don't know if this uh, adds, but I, I truly want to thank you also for the conversation uh, these last uh, months. Uh, I think it, it was a very important thing to do. Like uh, some, sometimes you will just write something, but I think uh, these spaces and also like the input or the careful reading is always like very important for, for anyone. So I also want to thank you for that and thank Radical Sounds and also Vered and Daniela, which I found your presentation very amazing, uh, <laughs> truly. So I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to share this space with you. I agree. Alejandra, the best. Because <laughs> reading is, a, is about caring too, it's about care. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. in another scale. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. So.
No, just adding to that too. Thank you so much. I mean, I, yeah, I felt my work was really cared for and um, in the publication and, and yeah, and in this panel, it's been great. Thank you so much for, for yeah, facilitating this, this space. Finalizing. Mm. 